Hello and welcome to this video on family diversity, postmodern perspectives. In terms of what we mean by postmodernity or postmodernism, it is a perspective or a set of perspectives that springs up from the late 1970s, early 1980s, or at the very least in the late 20th century. And those who adhere to this viewpoint argue that we've now entered a new postmodern phase, so a phase after the modern period. The two key characteristics of postmodernity with regards to society that we need to be aware of are firstly diversity and fragmentation. Society today is increasingly diverse and we're now more a collection of subcultures rather than having a single culture that binds us all together. This means that people can pick and mix their identity and lifestyles. We have become more different. We have become more fragmented, more split up in society. We're more uh, individualistic. We focus more perhaps on our own personal needs and we live to an extent in our own little bubbles. Also, rapid social change is another key characteristic. New technologies in particular have driven this rapid social change and have made the world feel smaller. We can, for example, jump anywhere in the world on a plane and very quickly get to the other side of the globe. We can move stuff much easier. So if we were buying and selling things, we can send them abroad very easy or we can import stuff from abroad as well. Uh, but also we can communicate instantly uh, with almost anyone in the world uh, through things such as the internet. This has transformed our patterns of work and leisure, so the way we work and the way we uh, relax is very different as a result of these changing technologies. In terms of the impact this has had on the family, well, it now means that family life is less predictable and less stable. We cannot be absolutely sure that, for example, we will live in a nuclear family for our whole lives, as perhaps we could have to a greater extent in the modern period. David Chill chimes into the postmodernity and family diversity debate, saying that now there is no single dominant family structure in postmodern society. So, whereas in modernity it was all about the nuclear family, today there is no single family type which the majority of us adhere to. Instead, we now have lots of family types, and individuals have more choice in their lifestyles, their personal relationships, and their familial relationships. We have more power over deciding what type of family we want to live in. There are advantages and disadvantages to this, however, so whilst we have the freedom to plot our own life course and consider the types of families we want to live in, this does come at the result of less stability. We now live in a more unstable world, our relationships are less stable, and there's always the possibility we could break up. Marriage used to be a tie that bound people together for life. Today, we now have high divorce rates. The access to divorce is much higher, and more people choose to cohabit and not get married at all, and so there's a greater likelihood of relationships ending. Judith Stacey in 1998 undertook a range of life history interviews to discover how greater freedom had in particular benefited women. She found that women were freeing themselves from patriarchal oppression. So it has been argued that the nuclear family is quite patriarchal in nature, that it gives power uh, in particular to men or to husbands to decide how, say, for example, money is spent or how resources are allocated. Women are now actually the main agents of change within the family, Stacey found. So if, for example, relationships to end, well, women are often the ones who are starting or instigating that process. They may be the ones who are likely to apply for divorce, for example. Women reject increasingly the housewife role, and they're far more likely today to return to work after childbirth if they indeed decide to have children at all. They're far more likely to decide to get divorced, and they're far more likely to decide to get remarried as well. As a result of this, Stacey found that women were creating new family structures to meet their own needs, in particular the divorced extended family, which creates a network of formerly married couples and cohabiting couples. So if we imagine two couples who perhaps have, you know, decided to get divorced, and if we imagine if, you know, two individuals from either of those couples then decide to get married, you've now got a bit of a network going on, so a very different family structure. Postmodern families are therefore complex and diverse meeting the individual needs of members and people are far more likely to you know, decide to end a relationship or to leave a familial setup if it no longer meets their personal needs. It is therefore pointless nowadays to make generalisation about the family as many of us will live in a number of different families throughout the life course and so instead we should think about families. The postmodern view therefore focuses on what influences individuals' decisions in their lives, so how we make our decisions. And Haraven did a range of different studies, of different in-depth interviews to discover the key moments or turning points in people's lives. And this approach was known as a life course analysis. And those turning points do tend to be things like 
getting married or perhaps even moving house or moving to university or having a child. The next area we need to consider is the individualization thesis. And this is the work of two sociologists, both Giddens and Beck. Anthony Giddens and Ulrich Beck, while not accepting all of the postmodernist ideas about today's society, apply some of these ideas to the family. And therefore, they put forward this individualization thesis, the idea that class, gender and family have lost influence over us than perhaps the sort or level of influence that they used to have in the past. We have become free and disembedded from traditional roles in society. We no longer feel that we have to adhere to certain, say, gender roles as perhaps we did in the past. The standard biography of the life course has therefore changed. No longer do we necessarily assume that we will grow up, get a job, get married, have kids, settle down and so on and so forth and choose roles based on our gender. Instead, we have a more of a do-it-yourself biography. We're far more likely to make our own decisions and choose what, what works for us at any particular point in time and change things as and when we feel that is necessary. This has huge implications for family diversity, as we shall see. Starting with Giddens then, Giddens argues that over recent decades, the family and marriage have been transformed by greater choice and equality between men and women. Relationships are free to exist based on sex and intimacy rather than on procreation thanks to contraception. So because of changes in technology, that is access to contraception, now people are able to decide, well, OK, am I in a relationship because I want to fall in love, get married and have children, which is the very traditional view of what a relationship perhaps should all be about? Or am I simply thinking I want to enjoy perhaps having an intimate sexual relationship with an individual for a period of time uh, with no view to actually settling down and having kids? And contraception makes that possible because in the past, without contraception, there was always the possibility that pregnancy could happen. And so as a result, that was likely to bind two people together more fully. The advent of feminism has given women greater opportunities in education and work and thus has provided them greater independence. They're free to make their own decisions about when or when they want to have a relationship, want to have children, or indeed if they want to do those things at all. As a result, marriage is no longer defined by law or tradition, leaving the two parties to define their relationship according to their personal beliefs about what makes a relationship positive and functional. So individuals are deciding what makes a good relationship. And this is what Giddens means when he talks about the pure relationship. That is that the relationship exists solely to meet each partner's needs and will continue only so long as it succeeds in doing so. So each individual in that relationship is aware that they could be independent. They could look after themselves. They've decided to come together, however, and have a relationship because one assumes they love each other. They're enjoying the intimacy. And for as long as they feel that that relationship is a positive thing and that it's helping them and it's good for them, they will continue. If, however, that relationship starts to break down, if one of the individuals starts to think, well, I don't really love this person anymore, or I don't want to be intimate with them, or I don't feel they're really supporting me in the way I would have liked, the relationship ends and they are not bound together perhaps as the way they should have been in the past that is to say through marriage or through having children today they can make their own decisions and do as they will. Giddens notes that with greater choice personal relationships inevitably become less stable and can be ended by either party at any time so there's greater volatility here it is a situation now that either individual can decide to end the relationship and perhaps we are seeing relationships start and end with increased frequency and regularity People perhaps today are likely to have you know, a number of relationships before perhaps they find the person that they wish to spend a prolonged period of time with. Giddens sees same-sex relationships as leading the way towards these new family types and creating more democratic and equal relationships. And this is because in same-sex relationships or partnerships, these are not influenced by tradition like heterosexual couples. So if we imagine uh, two gay men, they would come into a relationship because they're both male. There's no individual who necessarily feels they have to play a kind of more traditional feminine role. And so what has to happen is those two individuals have to discuss who's going to do what and have to work out you know, what role they're going to take. And so it's based more on choice and those roles are open to negotiation. And what perhaps we're seeing now in heterosexual relationships is a mirroring of what had existed previously in homosexual relationships. This led Western to describe these types of relationships as families of choice. Today, when we are with someone and we begin a family with them, or we have a family with them, we've made a decision to be with that person. And in a sense, we make a decision every day or every moment to continue to be with that person because we could end the relationship at any point. 
Winks also found that increasingly, friendship was a very important aspect of people's lives. People often feel so very close to their friends that they may start to see them almost as family. And this again is where we're starting to see more kind of network style families, where you have a number of individuals who may not be related by blood or may not be related by marriage, but instead are part of a family of choice. Alternatively, Ulrich Beck approaches the individualization thesis from a slightly different angle. He firstly says that we now live in a risk society where tradition has less influence and people have more choice. What we do as individuals is we calculate the risks and rewards of different actions and decisions. And if we feel that something is going to reward us, we will do it. If we feel it's too risky, we won't do it. And so we are more aware of risks in society and more aware of risks in our lives. This contrasts well with previous generations where people's roles were more fixed and they had less choice. Essentially, they were given or told what their role or position would be, and they didn't really have the freedom to do the whole calculation with regards to reward and risk. They simply got on with it. So, for example, everyone in the past was expected to marry. Once married, they would produce children. Women were expected to look after the house and the children. Men were the wage earners and decision makers and the disciplinarians within the household. And that was the role you were given. There was no real kind of question of that role there was no position really to do that weighing up kind of process there have been two trends which have undermined the patriarchal family Beck identifies firstly greater gender equality so this challenges male dominance in all spheres of life and women now expect equality in marriage and in work and in their relationships in daily life also greater individualism. Actions today are based on a calculation based on your personal self-interest instead of a sense of obligation to others. So when you're deciding whether to do something or not, you're going to think to yourself, well, is this going to help me or not? And if not, perhaps one won't do it, rather than thinking, well, I'll do it for the greater good, as perhaps we may have done in a more modernist society. This trend has given rise to a new form of family, Beck argues, called the negotiated family. In the negotiated family, what we find is that the, it does not conform to any one standard or traditional family setup. It varies according to the wishes and expectations of the members of that family who decide what is best for themselves through negotiation. They enter a relationship on an equal basis. So when a, two individuals come together, they essentially negotiate and work out, OK, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? What's best for me? What's best for you? And if they can come to an accommodation, a relationship will begin. And so they've done that on an equal basis which is far more democratic, one would say. So again, it's kind of echoing this idea that in post-modernity, people have more individual choice and freedom. In terms of the downsides, however, these relationships are less stable since members can leave, and if their needs are not being fulfilled, they're going to do this. They're going to walk away. They don't feel that perhaps the relationship is good for them, or they feel they could perhaps have a better relationship or a more meaningful relationship elsewhere, they will move on. This has led to the creation of what Beck argues as of the zombie family, which is that the family now cannot offer the security that it once used to, that it's become unstable, that actually, to an extent, families almost these zombie-like creatures just sort of slowly but surely rumbling on, but perhaps don't have the same kind of impetus and agency as they once did in the past. Finally, we need to consider the personal life perspective of the family with regards to family diversity. So Carol Smart and Vanessa May are the key names here. They agree that there is more family diversity, but they disagree with Beck's and Giddens' individualization thesis. They criticize the individualization thesis specifically, saying that it exaggerates the extent of personal choice and freedom, as often we are still constrained by norms. I mean, ultimately we have been socialized by individuals who themselves were socialized in the society. We've learned the norms and values of society. We still behave and adhere to those. We don't necessarily have complete carte blanche or complete freedom to do whatever we want as and when we want to do it. Individuals make choices relative to their personal and social context, Smart and May argue. That is, when we make decisions, we think about who we are, where we are, our situation, our environment, who's around us, and we make decisions based on you know, the needs of that situation, not sort of randomly or based on pure individualised rational logic. There's also the criticism that perhaps the individualization thesis ignores structural factors, factors such as class and gender. Perhaps these need to be considered more as these will play a role in influencing decisions people make. As a response, Smart puts forward the connectedness thesis. That is, that instead of individuals being disembedded and isolated, individuals are in fact social creatures who live in a web of connectedness, that we are connected to a range of different people, and 
that connection will have an impact on the decisions we make in our lives and the types of families that we live within. Finch and Mason argues that family connections and obligations limit choice, that we don't have complete freedom, that because we live within a family and we often have obligations to our family members, this will limit the decisions we make. We're not doing it purely just for ourselves all of the time. Overall, this challenges the idea of a pure relationship where two individuals come together and only stay together for as long as that relationship works for them or is useful for them and they will leave as soon as they feel perhaps they can find something better or it no longer works for them. Where lives have become interwoven, Smart and others would argue, it becomes impossible to completely disconnect them. So again, it's this idea of a web of connectedness. If we imagine a couple that come together and have a child, even if that couple is to break up, they cannot individually decide to no longer ever speak to that person or have any connection with that person. We generally find there's always going to be some form of connection between these two individuals by virtue of the fact that they had a child. So again, the idea of a web of connectedness. Those adhering to the connectedness thesis would also say that class and gender structures play a role. So, for example, post-divorce, the norm is for women to have custody of children. So children go with mum rather than with dad. And this may limit mum's ability to have new relationships in future. The children may act as a barrier, whereas dad, as a sort of single free agent, is less likely to be hindered in that regard. Men are generally better paid in our society, which is going to give them greater freedom with regards to what they can do and the decisions they can make. Therefore, women perhaps not being well paid or being as well paid means that their decisions are limited and perhaps women are more likely to be working class as a result, whereas men perhaps are more likely to be middle class. May would argue in summary that structure in terms of families is not disappearing, but it's simply changing. And this carries on the thing that really has begun with the Rappaports in the early 1980s. She finds that women now have far more freedom, but perhaps they still do not have quite the freedom that men have, that they cannot, in fact, have it all. Often there's this idea that many feminists propagate that perhaps women can have children and they can have a job and they can achieve all the things they want. Well, May would argue that perhaps that's still not quite the case, that perhaps the structure of our society still limits women and still means that they have to make key decisions at certain points about whether or not they want to get married, have children or have a career and these sorts of things. Finally, sexuality also needs to be considered, May would argue. So if we take lesbianism, again, focusing on women for a moment, this is now tolerated within our society. Homosexuality is a far more accepted part or normative part of our society. However, we do still live in what we call a heteronormative society. That is to say that society still assumes that the default position for any human being is heterosexuality. That is to be straight. And so as a result of that heteronormative ethos of our society or culture of our society, it may well be that some women, some lesbians decide to remain in the closet. And we could probably apply this to gay men as well. That's it. Thank you very much.